what am I looking at here? <laughs> what is this paper all about? Ancient DNA from the early Cretaceous. Wow, sounds intriguing. I mean, yes, I'm a, I'm a sucker for ancient DNA papers. I think they're really cool. But this one has a story behind it. And this one, I just, I, I'm perplexed as I'm reading through the manuscript. And what I want to do is I want to read you portions of this manuscript, and we're going to try to figure out what's going on here. Let me give you a little backstory. What, Joel, what are you talking about? What are you doing here? Well, I'm on the preprint server for biology. Right? This is a place where um, you know, I could write a manuscript and I could upload it to the preprint server. It doesn't mean it's published. It means it's available for anyone to see my manuscript. Um, but uh, you know, I can get feedback from others on that manuscript maybe before I submit it for peer review to get it published. Or maybe I'm hoping to attract a journal who, or an editor of a journal, like, hey, we would love to publish that particular article in our journal. Well, this one's been here for the last year and it's not been published. Now, that's a little bit of a clue as to preview of coming attractions here. This paper has not been published and it's a little over a year later. Uh, and maybe there's a quality issue with it. Okay. More backstory. How did I come across this particular article? This article was sent to me. All right. This was sent to me by email. Uh, from a young earth creationist, a young earth creationist who is very interested in ancient DNA, uh, a young earth creationist who actually was responding to a video that I made not too long ago, uh, critiquing uh, soft tissue preservation and ancient DNA um, stuff, things that young earth creationists say, and I was critical of young earth creationists. Uh, they, being a young earth creationist, wanted to provide me with some insights as to maybe things that I was missing. Uh, and, and I appreciate um, the, the kind exchange. I really do. And this person provided this particular paper, and they were very excited about the results from this paper because they're very interested in studying ancient DNA and maybe getting DNA from dinosaurs and be able to sequence it someday. So here we have it. Well, if you haven't figured it out, this is going to be a report of extraction of ancient DNA from fish from the Cretaceous period, right? About 100, I think maybe 120 to 140 million year old uh, rocks, uh, in which they report getting a bunch of different DNA sequences and comparing uh, modern fish with these uh, presumably 100 million year old uh, fish. Uh, so yes, this should be this should be headline news. Right? This should be something that all of you have heard of. This was put out there a year ago. I hadn't heard about it. Um, this is an astounding discovery. Right? This, this deserves to be in the journal Nature. Uh, and yet it isn't. All right? And maybe there's a reason for that. Again, we're going we're gonna to dive into this paper a little bit. And we'll read a little bit of it and maybe try to discover why it's not, um, not exactly hit the, the, the airwaves. Um, so this individual sent me this paper, and uh, I only just recently had a chance to open it up and start to read it and, and think about what's here. Um, so let's dive in. Insights from early Cretaceous, the promise of Lycop Lycoptera, ancient DNA sequencing. We've got a whole bunch of authors. They're all from the same institution, or at least uh, actually two institutions. Um, in Jingzhou, China, and it's the School of Agricultural Sciences. This individual, um, one, the one that caught my eye was the uh, was this individual author who's from the College of Tobacco, from Henning and uh, Agricultural University. Um, and yes, I, I had to look that up. I, I actually I saw this. I thought, is this some kind of made up paper? It's supposed to be kind of a joke because honestly, parts of the parts of the writing in this are uh, a little far-fetched. <laughs> um, and uh, I saw this, you know, College of Tobacco. Yeah, I, I went and looked. It's it's a legit place. I mean, the Henan Agriculture University is huge, and the College of Tobacco is a, a separate college within that university that has 78 faculty in it. And they're doing mostly molecular biology, molecular type research on, on mostly things related to tobacco or tobacco sciences. Uh, improving crop agriculture stuff, right? All right, so I downloaded the PDF. Um, we employed non-silica-based dipolar nanoparticle affinity bead technique. There's a mouthful. <laughs> right. 
to extract DNA from sedimentary rocks. Okay, they're going to extract DNA from sedimentary rocks. Right? That's your, your first, like, how are they going to do that? Yes, we'll look at the methods. L let's see how they did that, how they got DNA out of sedimentary rock. Uh, and successfully obtain ancient DNA from fossilized Lycoptera fishes from the early Cretaceous. All right, so this region in China. They took those sequences then. They got a whole bunch of them. Uh, and they constructed a library of, oh, well, they extracted DNA. They then sequenced a whole bunch of stuff. Then they compared, they took all their little pieces of sequence, and their pieces are fairly large, actually, on the order of 100 to up to 300 base pairs in length. That's uh, clue number one, that this may not be ancient DNA from <laughs> a 100 million year old organism to have that long length of, of sequence that you're able to obtain. Um, and then they compare that to a database that has, you know, you know, representatives of all kinds of living things, right? And that will tell you, like, what is it most similar to? Uh, a variety of form of filtering. They ended up with 276 highly homologous ray fin fish sequences. Um, 276 individual segments that ended up showing up as being like ray fin fish, which is what they were trying to extract DNA from or fossils of ray fin fish. Um, they did some phylo phylogenetic analysis and showed that this Lycoptera is closely related to a, f uh, a family, or I guess that's an order of fish that uh, contains uh, Lycoptera. All right, so after, after talking about this, uh, you know, they, they've got a certain number of sequences. I'll show you the figure in, in which they, they talk about the sequences. Um, they go on to talk about all these other molecular analysis they did on these sequences, uh, about the molecular evolution of these things and so forth. All right, enough of the abstract. Let's get into a little more of the meat of it. Um, the possibility of resurrecting ancient life has long been a fascination for science fiction enthusiasts. Yeah, you know, being able to, to go find things that have been extinct and bring them back. I mean, there's a lot of interest in that. However, to achieve this goal, uh, the genetic information of ancient species must first be obtained. Well, yeah, we need to know what the sequences are. Traditional silica-based DNA extraction techniques have been advanced to the point where we can extract genomes of horse species. Um, there's a, a notable horse species from Ice Age material uh, that has its entire genome has been sequenced. And that, that is thought to have been, thought to be, like I think it was 900,000 years old or something like that. One of, the, one of the oldest whole genomes that's been done. Yes, we have complete sequences of woolly mammoths. We have sequence of cave bear. We have sequence, whole genome sequences of Neanderthals, right? We have pieces of mammoths that have been preserved in permafrost. Um, however, these ancient DNA are usually fragmented, chemically altered during fossilization. These are, these are important things that they're noting. Yes, they're highly fragmented. The DNA, even from these things, are only maybe thousands of years old. Have been, have been broken into very tiny fragments, as opposed to the millions and millions of base pair fragments, uh, pieces of DNA in their original chromosomes. Uh, this makes it difficult to recover intact sequences from most specimens. Due to these challenges, previous studies have focused mainly on fossils from the early Pleistocene onward, right, the last million years. Some people believe that DNA cannot be preserved for over a million years under most conditions. Now, this is where the, the interest in with young earth creationism comes in, right? Young earth creationists think that at most any fossil is max 6,000 years old, but most are 4,500 years having been produced in the global flood 4,500 years ago. Um, and so surely if we can sequence something from an ice age from 4,000 years ago, it's logical that we would be able to extract DNA from organisms preserved in a giant flood just 4,500 years ago and be able to extract their DNA and get DNA sequences from most any type of organism. But as these authors note, some people believe DNA can't be preserved for over a million years. So this is a bit of a problem for a, you know conventional geological uh, thinking about the age of the Earth, right? That the dinosaurs ceased to exist 65 million years ago, so that any DNA from a dinosaur would necessarily need to have been preserved for 65 million years. However, certain fossils in sedimentary rocks and the Jehol biota, which is a very famous uh, biota in a, a fossil assemblage in China, 
Um, you got your feathered dinosaurs and all kinds of crazy stuff have been found in the in the in that particular uh, formation. Have retained cellular structures. Yeah, we've seen fine detail in the preservation. That's what makes it a really great um, set of fossils. Is that there's really fine preservation, and that preservation is due, as they note later in the paper, due to a particular event that occurred in history which is that this would have been like a lake system that had a volcanic explosion with a massive amount of ash. The ash falls into the lake, acidifies everything, deoxygenates everything, a bunch of organisms die, right, including these fish, right? And then they just fall to the bottom, they settle to the bottom, and there's no, it, there's no, you know, there's not much other life, right? And there's not very much oxygen, and it gets covered with volcanic ash. And volcanic ash is very fine, and uh, is able to, it has lots of silica in it. And so eventually that ends up creating these really beautiful fossils. And those are the fossils that they're going to deal with. And so they say, well, you know, maybe if there were cellular structures that we can see, we can see like, you know, we can see like soft tissue structures that are preserved in the silica um, um, ash. That suggests that maybe there could be DNA there and that might persist in even older samples, like a hundred million year old samples. Great. Um, yeah, these fish have been identified in this particular strata from the early Cretaceous. Uh, yeah, we found a lot of these types of fossils uh, near this town. Um, this for particular formation where the fossils are found is 120 to 140 million years old. I'm doing all this background because you're going to be astounded when I show you the number of different kinds of sequences from the different types of organisms that they got out of their DNA sample uh, from this rock. Uh, it's it's way beyond just these fish. I don't know why they put these fish in the in the headline of this article. I mean, yes, they've kind of focused on the fish. It's a whole bunch of other stuff they're claiming they found as well. Um, yeah, okay, so they were buried in this volcanic tuff. Conventional DNA extraction methods are unsuitable for sedimentary rocks. Mm, yeah, <laughs> it's like, you know, sedimentary rock, a little hard to deal with uh, in terms of extracting DNA. In this study, we employed non-silica-based dipolar nanoparticle affinity bead technique to extract DNA from the fish fossil and establish a DNA library. We'll go down to the the, uh, the method section in a moment. Is this? Don't worry, it's not too long. I mean, it, it sounds incredibly, uh, <laughs> uh, um, it sounds like a lot like that, but I'll try to tease out what, what's going on with there, in there. All right, let's get down here to some good stuff. To distinguish endogenous ans uh, answers DNA, <laughs> ancient DNA. Endogenous means um, DNA that actually belongs to the original organism, right? The original, you know, context of that uh, that rock um, versus environmental DNA, right? EDNA. Environmental it would be like just going to think of contamination, right? You know, this is the stuff that comes from the environment around us, just the fact I put my hands on the rock, maybe when I collect it, is going to leave some of my DNA on that rock. Uh, and water's been percolating through there, and you know who knows what other types of things have touched to this particular surface, and so therefore that could be contaminated. So that's a concern in any ancient DNA study that that you would embark upon, right? Your Your biggest concern would be, Am I actually extracting DNA from an ancient organism? Or am I just extracting stuff from <laughs> that's around today uh, and confusing it for something that's ancient? There has to be a way to distinguish the two. Um, now, of course, you're going to be really careful, as careful as you can, to get rid of modern contamination, but it's very, very difficult, right? Everything has bits of ancient DNA, oh, sorry, bits of DNA on it, contaminant DNA on it. We developed a rigorous data processing method. Uh, the, well, I was very unclear what exactly this method was, even when I read the method section. Um, it's, it's, it sounds more like, it's like, don't worry, we were very rigorous about this. This approach allowed us to pinpoint endogenous ancient DNA from the fossil fish itself. Right? We're sure this DNA came from the fossils, not from any other environmental contamination. We also, now this is, they didn't just get DNA from the fish. They also um, got DNA from contemporaries and its ancient food web parasites and prey alike. 
and were able to filter out modern contaminants. So they think that they've sequenced not only the fish, they think they've sequenced some um, parasites that might have been on the fish, and then maybe some other prey-type organisms that also had little bits of, of members of the prey that were also in that sedimentary rock. And they were able to get sequences from all of them and identify all these different organisms that were from uh, 120 million years ago. Through, because of this, we have uncovered a window into this extinct world, preserved over vast stretches of time through the presence of its DNA. This is a really, you know, huge discovery. I mean, this is absolutely astounding. Um, there are reports of staining of nuclei and staining of some bits and pieces of fossils that suggest there could be um, nucleic acid material left. But no one's ever sequenced anything from something so ancient. No one's even been able to extract anything to show that these are actually nucleic acids, right? Just that there's something there that's, that will pick up some stain that represents maybe there are some molecular bonds that are remnants of some nucleic portion of a nucleic acid. Uh, in one paper I read, I'm, I'm not going to, I was going to bring up this paper, but the paper mentioned that uh, it's possible that a bit of the sugar phosphate bond, a backbone um, could still be present in a certain molecular configuration. Basically, uh, as the molecule degrades, but if it also is going to swap bonds and become more stable, it might maintain a certain physical structure such that it would bond to these uh, these types of stains that bind to DNA, which are binding to the backbone. But the the basis, the A's, the T's, the C's, and G's, um, would be long gone in that case. In which case, we don't really have like strands of DNA, right? You have to have like complete strands, single strands of DNA with all the bases intact and the and the sugar phosphate backbone in order to use the enzyme that can go out and actually read the code. Um, and so it has to be in very good shape, right? The molecules have to be in their near original condition in order to be able to sequence them. And so that's what they're claiming they've done. They've sequenced long stretches of sequence from this sedimentary rock. Uh, okay, so it's 130, oh, I'm sorry, 130 to 140 million year old. Um, extraction analysis. The extraction and purification of fossil DNA was conducted using the GeoBio DNA extraction kit. I know of that kit uh, in accordance to the manufacturer's instructions. Ancient DNA mix in nanograms per microliter, right, which is a typical uh, concentration that we measure, represents uh, the production of proteins, polysaccharides, and DNA, whose concentration can be estimated from the OD value of the 260 ultraviolet peak. This is just standard stuff about how you would visualize the DNA and, and estimate its, its uh um, concentration. The ancient DNA and the ancient DNA mix has a certain degree of structural damage, which exact you would expect that. In, in ancient DNA, uh, without an organism being able to constantly repair its DNA, it's going to begin to degrade, and therefore there's going to be structural damage. So its competitiveness for PCR tech enzyme is poor. Tech, PCR enzyme tech is the DNA polymerase, which copies DNA, the enzyme that copies DNA. If there's structural damage, the enzyme has trouble actually copying the DNA. The core high throughput sequencing method is PCR, while eDNA, especially modern eDNA, has a relatively intact nucleic acid structure and may dominate in quantity, such as eDNA from local dominant species, such as there's mammals, there's humans, there's livestock parasites, there's cultivated angiosperms. I mean, all that is in the area right around where these rocks were um, uncovered. So we would expect to find lots of contamination. They're right. Um, we expect that there could be contamination in our sample, but if it is there, it will be easily sequenced and we'll get long runs of sequence that we would then say are like, well, that can't be ancient DNA because it's too good a quality, right? Um, all right, so what did they do? They took... Well, they took sequences they got that compared them to fish genomes, which then told them some of the sequences. Uh, we mapped 12,590,123 reads 
um, from the fossil fish to known fish genomes and counted the best match. And we found 11,313 reads that matched ray fin fish genomes. So initially they had 15 million sequences that, that, that pass from the fish fossil. Oh, oh, that actually means from their extraction from the fish fossil. So they got 15, I'm sorry, 12,590,000 individual reads. Each read is hundreds of base pairs. So we're talking about hundreds of millions of base pairs of sequence that they've generated. Um, and that's from this fish fossil, not necessarily the fish itself, but this fish fossil, the rock that the fish fossil's in. And they're hoping then to find out which of these sequences could actually be fish. Right? And they found out that 11,000 of them matched fish sequences. A match means that we have a huge database of sequences of genomes of, of nearly every type of living fish today. And since we know those sequences, you can simply take the sequences that you got from your ancient sample and you can blast them, compare them to all those other modern sequences. And if they have a high enough sequence similarity, you could say like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's a ray fin fish because only ray fin fish have that sequence for that particular gene. Um, to ensure accuracy, we only considered qualified match reads. Um, it's just a, it's just a measure of, of quality, which you can set various, uh, boundaries for. Um, we wanted extremely high probability of similarity. They had to be really similar to something in the database. And they found 900, uh, 693 of these sequences were still ray fin fishes. And then they had other sequences that matched other organisms. Uh, by the way, they had lots of human sequences, like lots and lots and lots of sequences. There's hundreds of thousands of human sequences came out of this sample. Uh, then they talk more about how they quantify these things. And in here somewhere, but it's not clear to me, I think what they're doing is they're trying to say that there were some sequences that weren't very good quality. Uh, and had slightly different ratios of, of, a to T's and C to G's, um, which could be a signature of degradation of certain base pairs. Um, I don't think they found nearly enough because a million year old sequence, you know, like these 900,000 year old horse has certain chemical signatures because there's certain bases. A, you get your A, C, T's, C's and G's. And one of those bases is more prone to changing, right? Being de I think it's deaminated. Yeah, so you have a you have a change in the molecular conformation, uh, which makes it then show up as potentially the wrong base uh, when it's sequenced. And uh, so you're going to get yeah, that's going to skew the typical ratios of ACTs and Gs. And the more it's skewed, the more it becomes apparent that this is more and more ancient DNA. Right, because if you take a modern sample, you just take my DNA and sequence it. I shouldn't have any skew at all. Take something that's been, you know, in the environment for a number of years, and you're going to have a small amount of skew. And something that's much, much older, and we've actually studied this because we have samples of known age that are a thousand or two thousand or five thousand years old. You're going to get a, a, a more skewed uh, frequency of certain base ratios. Right, so they should be able to do that. I can't see they don't really provide the data. And I can't see how much different the sequence is. But presumably, you know, you'd think that if this is millions of years old, it should be a lot different. Or in the young Earth creationist time, and, and uh, these authors are not young Earth creationists, you know, at all. Um, but a young Earth creationist would expect that um, something that is, this would be some of the oldest DNAs. They might also expect just because they have observational data from mastodons and horses and cave bears and extinct organisms that they have this damage to their DNA, they would expect to see that. Uh, this I can't read this paper and figure out exactly what's what's happening there. Um, because they end up with high quality, super high quality DNA, but I don't see that they're really talking about the actual individual bases and the ratios of these bases at all, which is what I'm used to seeing in ancient DNA papers. Um, features, uh, differences between ADNA and modern DNA. This is where they attempt to explain it. I'm, I'm not going to, I mean, you can go look this paper up and read it if you're really interested. Maybe you can tell me how they did that. All right, so they end up doing some phylogenetic analysis. There's all kinds of, you know, there's lots of stats. There's lots of numbers in here. 
These results suggest that an ancient DNA fragments can provide valuable insights into ancient phylogenetic relationships, even across large evolutionary distances. Um, the phylogenetic position of this fish, all right, where they they found sequences of these uh, four different genes. So this is just one little scrap. They found many, 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 many pieces of DNA. Um, you know, oh, they're going to all kinds of molecular evolution stuff here. Uh, but what I wanted to do was let's just get down to the methods. Uh, I completely don't understand the whole transposase diversity thing because they don't seem to have long enough sequences in my mind to be able to really be able to do this type of analysis. Um, and then they report that they've identified 28S ribosomal DNA sequences associated with the genome of this uh, minute parasite. All right, and so they found these parasites, and those parasites could have been on the fish. So maybe they've actually got ancient DNA of a parasite as well. Now, you're wondering through all this, uh, materials and methods, here we go. You're wondering through all this, how did they get this DNA? Like, what's the sample like? That was what I wondered. What, what was the sample? How did they prepare it? How can they be confident that they're at least got a chance of getting DNA from something that's 100 million years old? So here we go. Fossil DNA extraction. Washing the stone by DI water. There's no information about exactly where this stone came from. There's no... All right, so yeah, I just scrolled down here to the bottom of the paper where the figures are. And here is the... Here is, a, I think, the rock. It's, it's not, again, the legend's not clear on this in my mind, but this might be the rock that they tried to extract DNA from. Uh, and these are the fish fossils. And notice the uh, bar here, 10 millimeters. So that's a centimeter. Uh, a fairly small fish. Right, so they washed this particular stone in uh, DI water, uh, distilled water, at, at tap water pressure. Just normal sort of water pressure, right? The surface was clean. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, love, I love some of the language in this in this paper. I, I, I presume probably it's like been put through at some kind of translator. Uh, you know, maybe they used some kind of AI or something like that to... Uh, to write it for them after after writing it and then doing the copy editing for them. Uh, then they took the stone, um, the rock, and they dipped it into GeoBio geo DNA cleaner solution. All right, so that, that's basically like you're trying to sterilize the surface for a few seconds, moving it in out quickly, repeating and dipping step for three times. Washing the stone by DI water with tap water pressure until there is no additional cleaner solution. These aren't exactly sentences here, but uh, cutting the stone in a 10 by 10 by 5 centimeter All right, stock. So eventually end up with 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by um, 5 centimeters. And slicing the multi-layer stone into a single layer about 0.8 to 1.2 millimeters. I'm not sure of slicing it horizontally through the fossils, opening up a, a new set. Are they trying to get, I, what I'm thinking they would do would be like, here's a rock. We think it's got a bunch of fossils in it. And then what we're going to do is crack this thing open. Oh, I guess they cut it open, sliced it open. So we've cleaned the whole outside. We're going to say like the inside must be, you know, must be uh, uncontaminated, right? It's been preserved. So we're going to cut it open. They don't make any, like, they don't talk about doing this in an ultra clean room or under neon gas or any, you know, some inert gas or they, there's all kinds of steps that ancient DNA labs go through in order to try to prevent any side of outside contamination. Because one best policy would be like, hey, I've got a fossil, clean the whole outside, then with gloves on inside of some kind of chamber, you know, I've, I, it has some kind of inert gas in there. Uh, and some kind of pressure, uh, negative pressure, then I'm going to break open the fossil, right? And then I'm going to search down inside, right, and extract some little bit from inside, uh, hoping that, you know, no outside contamination has percolated through it. But at least, you know, give myself a chance to have as little contamination as possible. There's really no mention of that here. Um, I'm just going to 
assume that they did some kind of controls like that. They're at least trying to look inside the rock. They get this uh, thin section, and then they do scraping the texture portion of fishes. <laughs> right, so, right, you've got the you've got the remnants of the bones, you know, squished fish, right? And I, I guess they're just scraping off the 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 carboned uh, material there. Collecting the falling particles into a clean tube. They also scrape the outline portion away at least one centimeter from the textured parts and collecting the fallen part the particles in the separate tube. So you have sort of your bony section and then you got your, your flesh kind of squished out. And so they sort of extracted around the bony section. Then they used uh, pestles and mortar to grind the small particles into fine powders. I said, hopefully they're autoclave mortar and pestles where you do everything you can to sterilize all this stuff. Then you extract the DNA uh, from fine powder, uh, from the fine powders by the GeoBio DNA extraction kit. Now there is a solution you can add. This is sort of this is a bit of uh, what is done with ancient DNA studies today. There is basically a solution you put in there that tries to repair as much as possible the ancient DNA. Right. So if you have little nicks in the sugar phosphate backbone, there are ways to ligate that back together and sort of try to fix the DNA. Um, I mean, you, you can only, there's only so much success you can have with that. But with DNA that's not very old, you can often repair enough that you're going to get longer reads as a result. Great, there it is. I mean, that's your extraction protocol. So they literally ended up with... Um, uh, I could have sworn they talked about maybe 40 or 50 grams of material. That they're extracting from so it's actually a large amount uh they're extracting from hmm, not sure where that was all right bunch of papers oh here we go uh these are the dna extractions ah that's where i saw it um what fish portion well the textured portion uh, sample number one we got 30 grams that's a lot of material and uh, the ancient DNA mix we ended up with, it doesn't tell us how many milliliters or microliters we ended up with in our final solution, but we do have a concentration here of 33 nanograms per microliter. Um, you know, my students would be pretty thrilled to get 99 nanograms per microliter. That's quite a bit of DNA per, per uh, microliter. Uh, that's uh, actually a lot of DNA. Yeah, you know, shocking amount given the... Um, what, how rare that DNA should be in that sample. Uh, so it even if you have lots of environmental contamination, uh, of course, I don't know how much they concentrate it. That's, that's the other thing. It's like, well, what volume did you end up with? 50 microliters? So every microliter has 33 nanograms, or did you concentrate it down to like, hey, I only have five microliters left, in which case you concentrate all the DNA down to a smaller uh, volume. Um, okay, now... This is the list of different types of organisms that they sequenced. So that sample, they extracted this rock. They're making a big deal about it. They sterilized the surface. We went in the rock here. We pulled this out. We scraped that out. We extracted the DNA. And then we got 11 million different reads of sequence. And then we asked ourselves, what are all 11 million of those sequences are? Uh, we've got, you know, uh, you know, this is total something reads, I guess. Uh, 67... No, no, 674,000 prokaryote sequences, bacteria. Not too shocking that there would be bacteria there in that sample. Uh, but there's also 26,000 sequences of fungi. Uh, they have found viruses. They found algae. They found lichens. They found bryophytes. They found ferns. They found gymnosperms. found angiosperms. 30,000 of them. Those are flowering plants. Uh, and it, they break it down. There's a whole bunch of modern, you know, flowering plants that really there's no fossil record for you know in the cretaceous so um those have got to be modern contamination uh a bunch of other animals echinoderms uh they found reptile sequence bird 36 3635 separate sequences that align to bird sequences uh 697 of them to various poultry uh we've got one yeah, 131,000 mammals and 127,000 sequences from human beings. Uh, we even have some bat sequences. Wow. 
That is a whole lot of stuff. Oh, they didn't find any in the non-textured part, right? So they're only finding this DNA for some reason, a lot of this DNA only in the textured portion, which is, I guess, where the bones were. Uh, this, this to me doesn't make sense. You had so much contamination in the textured portion of all kinds of different organisms. And then just a little bit outside there, you extract it outside there, and suddenly you don't find any evidence for a lot of those same organisms. Um, you know, that little whole rock should be permeated with uh, contamination, or the contamination is not necessarily from the rock, as I suspect it's actually from the lab. I mean, this is in a big agriculture university, and they're probably doing this in a lab that they've done lots of other stuff with plants, especially. And so probably everything in the lab is contaminated with, with uh, a variety of different things. Uh, and when you're just sequencing every single little bit that you have in the tube, you're going to end up with all kinds of stuff. Major species contributing to the high sequence similarity uh, sequences included cultivated angiosperms such as wheat, barley, rice, corn, peanuts, rapeseed, soybeans, uh, all the things that this university studies, <laughs> like in many, many different labs. <laughs> wow, we found all these things. We also found poultry, right? We found chickens, ducks, mallards, goose, Right, we found pigs, yaks, sheep, cattle, horses, yeah, zebrafish. <laughs> These are all classic organisms that are studied in labs, like they have at this very at this particular institution. Uh, a bunch of different kinds of fish, and yet out of all this, they're admitting that. This is an ancient DNA, right? We we're not saying they're not saying that all of these things are a hundred million years old. That they even know that there's no fossil record that's even 100 million years old for a lot of these things. So there's no expectation that they should even be there. Uh, and they have high sequence similarity to things that are modern. But there are some sequences that had less sequence similarity and they they thought were more damaged, although, again, I'm very, I don't see the statistics on the damage, so it's hard for me to assess that. Um, somehow, some of these sequences are pigeonholed as being ancient DNA and therefore... Um, yeah, comparison of these ray fin fish ancient DNAs with human DNA. Well, the mean identity, you know, was 98%, meaning the sequence we got was 98% similar to a modern human. Um, and But for the Lycoptera, right, the fish that we thought that we were extracting, compared to a modern fish that's today, because there are these same types of fish that are alive today, uh, there was only 68% identity. Well, that could be because they're super old, right? They, they've had a lot of DNA changes over time. Well, it could also be that, you know, they have short sequences and these things are aligning to, you know, something that is not in their database. All right. I mean, what it would be is not in their database. So it's aligning to this other fish that they think they're looking for. And because they think they're looking for a Lycoptera, the thing that's the most similar to it in this extraction is only 68% similar. But it very well might be 100% similar to something that's actually living today, but it's not in their database. Uh, but more importantly, the thing that caught my eye here was this. Uh, the GC concentration is almost the same. And then up here, the mean length of the sequences, 135 base pairs, right? So the contaminant human DNA is in 100, is, is uh, the average length is 135 base pairs. They had ones up to 300 base pairs and then all the way down to like 20 or 30 base pairs. So the fragments they're getting from their DNA extraction, you know, it's broken DNA in the environment is 135. Look at the average for the fish. Ancient DNA is 139. Right? That's not statistically significant in its difference. We'll just call it the same. So the length of sequences are the same for something that's 100 million years old versus human DNA, which is probably in the lab. And maybe the person amplify, maybe the person who's doing the extraction is actually amplifying sequencing their own DNA. Um, and so they are broken to the same amount. That is not 
to be expected. If this was mammoth DNA and it was only 4,000 years old or 50,000 or 80,000 years old, right, in the conventional sense, um, we're looking at getting more like an average of 40 or 50 base pairs and you'd be pretty happy with that meaning you know you have some that are over 100 but you also have a lot that are less than 50 base pairs the neanderthal genome uh had a fairly low average as well i mean i think it was it was still maybe close to 100 uh, but this number of 139 being the same as homo sapiens being very similar to what all the other sequences are which they're not claiming are ancient dna I still, I just don't understand how they're making this call that obviously these sequences, out of the 11 million sequences we got, somehow we are sure that these sequences are from, are 100 million years old, whereas the other ones are a few years old. Makes no sense to me. Um, yeah, there's our fish again. Uh, this is a this is their sequence they came up with that is a combination of four different genes that they then uh, compared to the four genes in all these other types of fish. And what they're saying is, look, it's very different. It didn't come out just the same as some other fish. Uh, here's, here's the thing. Okay, so you got these four different genes. And you think you're trying to sequence that particular fish in that's the fossil. How do you know those aren't four different contaminants from four different types of fish that each gene is a different fish but you kind of like put them all together that's like you know i put three different organisms together and so of course it's going to be like well i'm kind of like this but i'm also kind of like this but i'm also kind of like that but i'm also kind of like that and so you, you kind of kind of come out in the middle right because you can't be 100 percent similar to something that you're not <laughs> so um this analysis also isn't mm, terribly clear to me either now i admit i'm kind of running out of steam looking at this paper I have looked at every single detail, haven't tried to redo their analysis, but it's very hard to figure out what they did. Uh, the, the writing is not clear enough to be able to probably re-figure out this analysis. I think this was sequence reads as well. Yeah, that's, that's it. That's it. Um, okay, so insights from the early Cretaceous. They have hundreds of sequences that are hundreds of base pairs long of multiple different genes from the Cretaceous period that represent these fish, but also represent parasites and some of their prey. So they have sequences from multiple different organisms from the Cretaceous, at least that's the claim. Again, this should be just blaring headline news. This is this is one of the, the most astounding discoveries in ancient DNA. Well, well let me take that back. I mean, back in the late 90s, there were some really astounding claims, you know, like bacteria that had been raised from the dead that were 500 million years old, or there was, um, you know, sequences from a variety of different organisms that were claimed to be hundreds of million years old, uh, and fairly good sequences too. But all of those, the scientific community doesn't believe are real. They believe they're all contaminations. Which is, you know, not unexpected when the very first people who ever tried to get sequences out of old organisms, right, old samples, um, didn't really think that much about contamination, right? Some, some of those studies, they didn't really do anything to prevent contamination they, they, because they were unaware of how bad of a problem the contamination would be. Um, and so then, so ancient DNA got a really bad rap because it consistently we had got big headlines because you know really some of the best journals in the world were like yeah these are this is hot news right and um and we hadn't perfected the technology and we weren't hypercritical about the techniques because we weren't even aware of what all the problems could be and so these things got big flashy titles right really clickbait huge like wow and we just found an older and older organism everyone's racing around a bunch of labs are racing around trying to find the oldest sequence and then it just it all came crashing down all of a sudden it's like other people tried to repeat the analysis they couldn't do it and then they then they point out obvious flaws like your sequence that's 100 million years old is like identical to something that's alive today I, I, well, that doesn't really make sense uh, and so deep skepticism arose over ancient DNA. Um, 
And so for a while there, it was it became hard to publish ancient DNA um, samples. And then gradually, uh, Savant Pabo uh, in particular uh, in Europe, he really came up with a, a series of basically protocols that anyone who wants to publish ancient, ancient DNA really needs to follow these protocols. And what I don't see here in this paper is the thorough protocol that he, he has established um, to make sure that you've eliminated as much possible contamination as possible. Um, so then from there, ancient DNA studies began to start to accumulate again, you know, starting with fairly recent stuff and then trying to push it back further. And now we're, you know, we have DNA sequences from comfortably in the million uh, year range. Um, but most of your like genomes that we've sequenced are in the range of more like 20 or 30 or 40, 50,000 years old. Uh, but nothing, no sequences that anybody accepts right now from, you know, 50 million years or more. Well, really, I don't think anyone accepts anything that's more than 5 million years old. And the ones between 2 million and 5 million are, are there's deep skepticism about. But I'm sure there are some that think they're legit. Um, but beyond 5 million years, mm, I, there's no compelling reason right now to believe that we have any DNA sequence that's from actual sequence that's that old. Uh, and so this paper, were it to get published... All right, pa pass through the peer review process should make significant news. Would everyone believe it if it was published just like this? No, no way. I, I am deeply skeptical myself. There's way too many things that aren't explained in this paper. The evidence is not compelling. Um, and so I, I don't, I, it's possible it could get published because nearly anything can get published at some point you'll find somebody who will take the paper especially if you're willing to pay to have it published um, so maybe it will appear in a journal someday but here here we're a year later and nothing's happened uh, so i suspect that uh, they've not gotten any good feedback and nobody wants to publish it you know they might have submitted it to a couple of journals and got rejected by all of them um, now I think some young creationists might try to claim that uh, this is too hot and spicy, right? You know, and nobody wants to admit this because this would be um, this would be a, a paradigm shifting uh, sort of uh, discovery. Personally, I think that we will eventually get some little tiny bits of sequence from organisms that are tens and maybe a hundred million years old. I really think it's possible, but it had to be under extraordinary conditions of preservation. And we're not going to get large amounts of it, probably. It's going to be little bits and pieces here and there. So I don't, I don't dismiss the possibility that some DNA could survive that long. And I don't dismiss the possibility that some of these studies that are showing that possible staining of DNA from ancient things might not actually be staining nucleic acid. Whether we'll be able to get the sequence from that nucleic acid is a whole different story. Um, but I think it could be present. I think I think some bits of nucleic acids, some portions of nucleic acids could survive under just the right conditions for that length of time. Um, but once again, this would be a, just a radical paper. This should be like earth shattering news and everybody should be trying to do the same thing and try to recreate these results. Because if you truly could get this quality of, of DNA from sandstone or I'm sorry, from uh, volcanic rock, and fossils, then um, I know multiple people who'd be rushing out to try to, you know, find their bit of claim to fame by actually sequencing ancient organisms, be able to compare them to present ones. It'd be awesome. It'd be totally cool. I'd love it. I wish this were possible. I wish this paper were true. Um, I wish that this was real, but doesn't at all feel real to me at all. I just said all twice in the same sentence. Ah, oh, that's late. All right, that's my uh, that's my meanderings through this paper, and I'll uh, uh, yeah, I'll be, I'll watch for uh, whether anything ever happens uh, with this paper. All right, let's uh, let's call it quits there. Thanks. Talk to you later. Bye bye.